All right, well, welcome to Healing School. Uh, as we were just discussing, this is the first healing school we've ever had here in 13 and a half years. So if you're watching this, uh, whether it's on YouTube or wherever we've got it posted, man, we are grateful that you're tuning in. So I'm Pastor Steve Crowder, uh, one of the pastors here at Highway Community Church. And we're just excited to dive into this because at the beginning of our church, God gave us the vision passage of Isaiah 35. And out of that, man, it, it is, is a prophetic passage of what the church, not just highway specific, but the church should be about, what it should look like, what it should feel. And, and if you read that, which uh, here in a couple months, we're actually going to dive into it. I can't wait for that series. Uh, but, but you dive into it, you, you'll find that there's, there's healing throughout it. And uh, I don't know about you, but um, when I read Acts, there's just a lot of stuff, and especially the New Testament from Jesus and the Gospels through, through Acts and the church, that, that there's a lot of manifestations of people getting healed. And, and I know for us collectively, I mean, we want to be the church, not, not the old church. We, you know, we look back, well, that was the, the young church, the new church. Like, I don't know. The Holy Spirit was more excited at that point in time. I, I don't, you know, no, it's the same spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that birthed the church, and it dwells in us, quickens us, quickens our mortal bodies. And so just thinking through this, this class, uh, so we'll have eight sessions. We're going to take April off, uh, for those that are watching, just so you know. Uh, but here's, here's kind of the rundown, uh, the theme God gave me, and this all came out of uh, my morning prayer here in the auditorium uh, at the end of the fast, the uh, 21-day fast that we did as a church. Um, and so this, this whole thing came out, and I just started writing, started making notes. And, and so this is the passage that really resonated in my heart out of Matthew. Matthew 8, 16, you'll see that at the top of your notes. But when evening had come, they brought to him, talking, to, talking about Jesus, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word. And, and just check this last, last part of this phrase. And healed all who were sick. So here's the thing we're going to look at as we unpack over this next season, and we'll see after July if, if we're going to just go ahead and keep going through the whole year. We'll, we'll, we'll see all that. Uh, but But... You'll find all through the Gospels that word all is used a lot. Almost everywhere you see a crowd, a, a group of people uh, coming towards Jesus, you, you, you never find him saying he selected certain ones. Like, like the crowd came, he healed them all. The crowd came, he healed them all. He, he, he talked about faith almost every time he's interacting with people on healing. So here's, here's our run through of uh, the next, uh, next seven weeks of the, uh, that we meet. Uh, so next time we come together, we're going to talk about the prayer of faith, then receiving your healing, uh, keep out the doubt. He healed them all, which I just kind of alluded to with that one. Uh, manifestations and miracles, the healing power of the word, the stripes of Jesus. And future topics, I've just been making notes as things come up in my spirit. Uh, lose from your affliction, redeem from the curse. We're going to talk about Job and, thorn, and Paul's thorn. Uh, what do you believe? Uh, and the list, list, list goes on. And so it's just, we, we have such a limited amount of time when we're in topical studies in, in the church service in the morning. So this gives you the chance to, you know, pull out the spiritual shovel, shovel and we're going to dig. We're going to go a little deeper and find out what, what the scripture says about the word. And so there'll be times where I'll probably unpack maybe if there's different um, uh, theological perspectives of a topic um, that I feel like, well, okay, look, here's what different people teach so that you have an understanding. You're going to interact with other people, even other Christians that see it differently. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes that's a hard thing to navigate, especially if we come from a, a religious tradition, a Christian tradition that taught something completely opposite of what we're going to hear in this season. That, that's that, that challenge to us sometimes to, to open up the word and actually believe it versus our tradition, you know. And so, um, so ultimately, uh, as we've talked about a group here, as you're watching video, this is a safe place. If you ever have any questions, just send me an email at steve at highwaycommunity.com, and uh, we want to journey with you in this topic as well. So if you will, go ahead and turn to John chapter 14, and we're going to start um, with this passage I felt like we, we're kind of laying the groundwork, you know what I'm saying? Just We're kind of just setting it up and, and getting ready for what God wants to download in this season to us. And so I encourage you, if you're watching online, take some notes, get a pen, you know, get your, your, your iPhone out, take some notes on this. But John chapter 14, we'll read 11 verses here, starting verse 1, and I'm in the English Standard Version. And so... Uh, it says, "Let your hearts not be troubled, or let let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Uh, believe also in me." So Jesus is talking letters in red here. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, 
what I have told you, that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you will be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, then you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do not know him, or, or you, yeah, you do know him and have seen him. Make sure I say that correctly. Verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. <laughs> Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. So, you know, it's really as I was kind of diving into this and thinking, this is a setting, the Last Supper, Jesus unpacking stuff. I mean, like, this is, this is like the end of his ministry, all right? And, and you see almost like the disappointment, the frustration as a, as a rabbi, as a teacher. Like, you, Philip, really? Thomas, really? You really not? Have you been with me this long and you still don't know? There, there, where are you going? Where are you going, Jesus? We don't know where to go because we don't know where you're going. Well, show us the Father. I mean, you know, I mean, you just picture, and I know Wednesday they're going to start the Chosen. I mean, you know, good old looking Jesus, like, pulling his hair out. You know what I'm saying? Like, like guys, have you still? See, for us, we obviously we've got the written word. We've got what well, the Holy Spirit inspired uh, uh, men of God to pen, and we're, we're seeing this recording, and, and we're, we're reading it from a perspective they didn't have. They're, they're journeying with them. They're, they're you know, it's taking steps. They're, they're operating. Jesus operated under the Old Testament covenant. Uh, the laws of, of the Jewish uh, tradition. I mean, this, this is where he's at. So we have a much clearer revelation of who he was, you know, what he has done, uh, who we are in Christ. I mean, think about the things we can almost take for granted these disciples didn't have complete access to. I mean, we have the full description and explanation of parables. And they're like, what did he mean by that? Well, okay, guys. Come here, let me explain this parable. If you don't get this one, you ain't getting nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was the interactions they had. They saw the miracles. They saw the manifestations. I mean, literally, they touched the, 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 the experience themselves. And, and John even said, it's, it's really interesting you find the Gospel of John. He said, if everything that Jesus said and did was recorded, that, that the earth could not contain the scrolls. I mean, like, there's so much more than what we even read in the Gospels that Jesus said and did. So just kind of preface that, because we look at it and like, wow, that, that's, I mean, really, if you think three years of your life and every moment was documented, it would be a lot longer than this, right? I mean, and so you're looking at these stories and these gospels of what happened, and they were, they were in the middle of all of it. They were experiencing it. I mean, even later you hear, you know, that, that, that people, when they were persecuted, so they could tell they had been with Jesus, you know? So there was this residue. They didn't even, at that point in time, realize to what extent he had, had imparted to them his spirit, his culture, and all that. But uh, even after three years of being with them, they struggled with certain aspects of who he was. I mean, you would think, well, way back when Peter had this revelation, well, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's it, Peter. You know, you would think at that point in time, all the disciples were gung-ho and it, and they, they, they bought in, um, but they still struggled here. Here, you find when the disciples like, show us the Father. Show us the Father. They didn't understand that Jesus' whole purpose and ministry on the earth was to show and reveal the Father to them through himself. Jesus said in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In the chapter right before that, in, in chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So it's interesting, you just take even John recording Jesus, you know, you hear me say this all the time, but hashtag Jesus quotes. And what, why do I say that? Is because it's hard when you, when you come to something Jesus said to argue 
no, he didn't say that. No, he didn't mean that. You know, I'm like, it's in red. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we're looking at it. We're like, oh, wow. Okay, so his purpose was to reveal the Father. These scriptures tell us Jesus was not, listen, was not the originator of the words he spoke, right? I mean, again, I'm, I'm simplifying as we go because this is how I learn. This, when I read the scripture, I love, because I grew up in the church and I've been in through so many different traditions. Maybe you remember our story. I mean, all different kinds of denominations. So I've heard different perspectives all my life. So when I get into reading scripture, I love to stop, step back, and actually listen to what I'm reading. Like picture being in the middle of that and, and how they process. What was, what was the intent? But right here, based off of what I'm reading, Jesus was not the originator of the words he spoke. He wasn't the originator of the works that took place. I mean, you th- just think about it. And again, it, it's so awesome when you stop and think. You know, I've, I've heard, and I probably said, you know, if Jesus walked in the room of uh, some churches, you know, you would think things would start breaking out. But Scripture shows us if they don't believe he can do or will do or whatnot, I mean, it's... It's, he's trying to get you to understand what the Father's heart is, what he is trying to do. But he identified those works as being evidence or proof of who he was. He, he said, again, if you can't believe me for the things that you've heard me say, like if you do not believe in my teaching, <laughs> at least you believe based on what you've seen, the works. So here's where we're going in some of our discussion, because all of us want to see that manifest in the church now. Why? Because people can argue with what you teach, but they're getting healed. It's hard to argue with that. You see what I'm saying? So what y'all are saying is exactly where God's leading us in understanding that. So, you know, if Jesus came to the earth to do the will of the Father, which he did, and and granted, let me preface this, like his will was not in contradiction to his Father, right? But there was a hierarchy of wills. You, You find Jesus... When we're talking about his assignment on the earth, what he came to the earth to do, when he gets down to the wire and he's at the garden, he's wrestling with the will. Not my will, but yours. He's submitting himself to the Father. Why? Because he sees this is the work the Father has assigned to him to accomplish in the earth, and it's not going to be fun. So he submits his will to the Father's will. But in, in all of everything else, his will was compatible with the Father's. They were one. He, he did what the Father did. He said what the Father was saying. He was compelled by the Holy Spirit to tell us that the Father was the originator of all he did and said. Okay, do, do, are y'all checking with me so far on that? The words that he's speaking, which are producing the signs and miracles, came from the Father. Everything about his life was to point people to and reveal to people the Father. That's where his frustration arises with the disciples. You've been with me this long, and you still don't get it. The Father, right here. You've been living with him, interacting with him, talking to him, listening to him, laughing with him, asking questions with him. This is the Father. This is what the Father looks like. I mean, even think of the prophetic words given back generations prior that we read at, at, at Christmas time, and, and, and Isaiah prophesies the names of Jesus, the names of the Messiah. Okay, keep going. Keep going. Everlasting Father. Have you ever read that and thought, that's weird? I mean, it's, it's the prophetic word of the Messiah. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I mean, all, all these others we use, he was actually prophesied to be the everlasting Father. So he's demonstrating the Father's spirit, and that's good, shooting from the hip. So let's put that in the healing context. Think about this. Everything that Jesus did regarding healing the physical body, all the words of healing that he spoke and taught, all the healing miracles, all the faith he inspired with others around him to receive their healing with. Every moment that's recording in the Gospels and Scripture was him revealing the Father to us. 
I mean, I want us to get that because it's an amazing thought. When Paul starts talking to Timothy and here's this understudy, here's this apprentice, and he's, he's mentoring him, he's talking to him in the second letter, 2 Timothy 3.16, he says, all scripture. Timothy, just so you know, all scripture. Just come on, say all scripture. Now, I don't mean, again, just part of it. No, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful. Well, what's it useful? To teach us what is true, makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us what to do and what is right. So, so, so to be a good follower of Jesus, we say this all the time, but we got to be teachable. If we, we're posturing ourselves, God, I don't know all the scripture. Teach me. Talk to me. Reveal to me your truth. Even Jesus said he was going to send the Holy Spirit to remind them of things he spoke. I mean, again, I love the, the dance, the, the unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mean, one's, you know, Jesus pointing that, and he's sending the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's pointing to Jesus, and, you know, it's that unity within them to, to, to ultimately glorify the Father, but, but the experience of all that was to help us to grow, to learn, to take the head the, the mission, even we talked about last week, and submit to this, come under his mission. And so we're under the head, headship of Jesus, who is doing and saying and revealing everything the Father is. And the Holy Spirit comes alongside the church, fills us, empowers us to go and do the works that Jesus wanted accomplished in the earth. So this means if we are teachable and all Scripture is given profitable to us, that might correct us. It, it means if we read something, we hear something in this season that, that comes against our opinion, listen, it, 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 might, it might contradict our theology, our doctrine, but the goal here is to reveal truth. That's what we're all after is truth, not something just to agree with what my, my belief already is, but, but, but just know if it's Scripture, it's useful. It's going to help us know how to do this right. And, and that's the goal. It, it's, it's left to myself, I'm probably going to flub it up. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to mess up. I'm going to, but again, when I get Scripture, now it gives me some foundation to stand on. Now it's not just my opinion. Well, Pastor Steve said, so I'm going to. No. I mean, it's like you know, the sons of Sceva going in to cast out demons. And the demon's like, I know Jesus. I know Paul. I don't know who you are. And kicked them out of the room Be because they were trying to do something that, that well they just saw done and it wasn't coming out of a revelation inside them. They weren't coming from a place of authority, and and, and that's what I want us to get uh, really running towards and after that. This is useful. Come on, it's useful to hear the word of God. In Mark twelve twenty four, Jesus answered and said to them. Are you not therefore mistaken? He's talking to the Pharisees, talking to the scribes. I mean, they got the, they've got the Torah memorized. They've got Scripture memorized. He says, because you do not know the Scriptures, nor the power of God. I mean, they had Scripture memorized. But he said, you don't know it. You, you don't know the Word. You don't, you're, you're not fellowshipping with it. You're operating in a list of do's and don'ts. You're not in communion with the word, therefore, you don't know the power of God. And I think to me, that's always been, and Grant, that was, that was recorded by Jesus in Mark, but that's always been like a yikes statement. It's like, you can know scripture, not know the power. But if we stop and we think there's a lot of Jesus churches in our country, in our cities, in our states that know scripture and see no power. It can happen today. And you and I, we're on a journey. We don't want that to be our story. We don't want that to be Highway's story. Man, they know a lot of scripture. Nothing happens. You know what I'm saying? We want to flesh that out. So let's not, let's, let's, let's at least intend not to bend scriptures to fit what we believe or what we want to believe. Let's bend what we believe to conform to the word. And that's going to have to require some intentionality. And I think Paul, you know, meant something like that along those lines in Romans 12 when he talks about renewing our mind with the word of God. We get, it's almost like, it's like, I mean, if you, you take his imagery, it's being brainwashed with scripture. 
<laughs> because if we like peel that back and start looking at our beliefs and our thoughts sometimes, it's kind of ugly. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it's kind of messy. It's kind of murky. It's, so for us, the scripture can get in and divide and, and help us see things clearly. And the scripture washes our mind. It renews our mind. It gives us new thought patterns of how we see ourselves, of we, how we see God, how we see the people around us, even, even what we taught this morning, how we flesh that out in the world around us. The psalmist said in 119, 130, the longest psalm in the Bible, one of the verses says, the teaching of your word gives light, listen, so even the simple can understand. And so if you ever approach the word and you're like, man, I I didn't go to Bible school, I'm in the uh, seminary, or I I, I don't know Greek, I don't know Hebrew, or it's okay, it's okay, right here. The word gives light, and even the simple can understand. And I praise God for that because that means I can understand. You know what I'm saying? Just a simple man, you know, from East Texas. So here's the thing. Here's where we're going. This first topic of this season starting off is his will to heal. Matthew 8, 1 through 3. When he came down, talking about Jesus again, when, when Jesus came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus put out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So here's the thing. I, I love when the scripture just starts kind of revealing stuff to us. This is the only documented occurrence in the Gospels that someone asks Jesus this. I mean, just think, that's kind of surprising. I mean, I hear Christians all the time wrestling with this question, and there's only one account, one instance in the entire Gospels of someone asking Jesus, is it your will? So that in itself, I mean, out of the crowds, hundreds, thousands that he was constantly surrounded by, that should speak volumes to us about people's perspective in that day of Jesus' ability and his will. One account, one occurrence that's documented in Scripture. You can say, well, Steve, again, John said, if everything Jesus said and did, I get it, I get it. I'm just saying, one moment in this that, that to me is significant, only one time. The Holy Spirit revealed one time that someone came, someone asked him, is it your will? Let's talk about it. So this man comes to Jesus in the midst of his pain. I mean, his his decaying, flesh-ridden body, he's approaching Jesus and says, can you? I I know you can, but will you? Will you? And and so here's where I was thinking, you know, even in church context, the you can is the easy part. I mean, there's a lot of Christians, a lot of Christ followers that know he can, but too many of the church don't know if he will or if he wants to or if I've got to achieve some state of holiness before I'm worthy of healing. See, one occurrence in the Gospels, one time, and here you find Jesus. I love it. A- immediately, I mean, an instant, like one question. I know you can. Are you willing? Be healed. I'm willing. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, he, he puts to rest. Uh, even Luke's account of that says immediately, immediately. I mean, there was no question here. We can identify God's power. He is able. He is willing to. He is willing I love it. Jesus didn't stop. So, whoa, 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 whoa. Let her see. Let her see. Yeah, that's a big deal. Let me, uh, let me go talk to my father for a little bit. Let me see how he's feeling on this. Because, I, mean, I mean, you know, you know what he's trying to teach you right now. Let's think about this. Now, see, I, I know you can, but are you willing? He said, I'm willing. Instantly, he reaches out and touches the leper, and the leper is made Whole one occurrence of this question being presented in the Gospels, and Jesus takes no time, zero flat, to handle that question so you and I would understand it's his will. It's his will. And I tell you, that's significant to me. I will be clean. Only time, and Jesus deals with it instantly. You remember the story of Acts of Peter's vision? Uh, going to share uh, Jesus with Cornelius. The, it's the first time a Gentile, his house, they get saved, get filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking tongues, all that. But it's documented in Acts. 
So Peter is sharing the gospel in that moment in Acts 10, verse 38, and he says, he's, he's describing the gospel, the story of Jesus and, and how Jesus did stuff. Remember, Peter lived with him. He did ministry with him. So he's speaking from a firsthand account, and now Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he says, this is what happened, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with Holy Spirit and with power, and Jesus went about doing good and healing all, again, the word all, all who were oppressed by the devil. Why? For God was with them. So let's take a, a few minutes that we have here together, and let's just kind of dive into what Dr. Luke is, is recording in this book of Acts. Jesus was anointed by two things. What, what was it? Holy Spirit and power. Holy Spirit and power. So, so let's stop and just look at the word anointing. God anointed Jesus. God anointed Jesus. So we started looking at that. And the word anointing, it means set apart, consecrated. Set, it's holy for, for the work of God. And here's the thing. The very meaning of the word Messiah is the anointed one, the embodiment of the anointing, the one who the anointing will rest and will remain. So you look all through the, the Old Testament and the stories up to Jesus. I mean, there was anointing that came upon prophets, priests, kings. The, they prophesied. They, they, uh, they gave words of knowledge and wisdom. Um, they spoke. They wrote. They, 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 the miracles that did happen. You look at judges. You look at, you look at anointing. Jesus steps on the scene, and it's different because he embodies the anointing. It's not just, well, the anointing was on them to do this work. No, he contained it. He was the one that the anointing rests. But here's the question. And again, if you approach this as a child teaching and you stop and think, why did Jesus need to be anointed? I, I mean, I think that's a reasonable question to ask. Uh, let's step back, okay? Is he, a son of, is he the son of God in the earth? I mean, what we all say, I mean, is he the son of God in the earth? Well, why would he, the son of God in the earth, need to be anointed by the Holy Spirit and by power? Here's where we wrestle this out. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, you find again one of Paul's letters to the Christians in Philippi. And let's look at verse 5. Five, have this mind among yourselves, which is in or which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, talking about Jesus, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. What did Jesus do? He humbled himself. Became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name, so that at that name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So, what you find Paul having a revelation of is what Christian theology calls kenosis. Kenosis is the act of emptying yourself. Okay? So he is emptying himself, Jesus' own will, and becoming entirely receptive to God, his Father's divine will. So there's, I mean, many theologians with long abbreviations have studied and argued what this fully means. All right, so I mean, we can have all different perspectives. I could get, I could get on the phone right now and call probably five pastors I, I deeply love, and they would all see this potentially different of what that means. Kenosis. What does that mean that he laid down? Because so some argue and they're looking. Well, if you say that he gave up his, he laid down his deity powers, came to the earth. Well, then then he wasn't God. You're just saying he's all man. No. So, so I want us to really grasp, so, so what I'm teaching, what I believe, I believe in the incarnation. God became man. God, the word, took on flesh. What does it look like to step out of heaven in complete deity power? Uh, you're omnipresent. I mean, you can be anywhere all at once. You have all knowing, you're all powerful, all that. You, you find him as a baby laying in a manger. So here's the thing. 
Because some argue, well, if you believe he laid down his deity powers, then he didn't know he was the Son of God. Well, I can read in Scripture at age 12, we just mentioned, in the temple, he's talking to his parents, natural parents, Joseph and Mary, saying, don't you remember, don't you know I should be about my father's business? He's at the temple. He's not at the carpentry shop. I mean, like, he, he understood. It said he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. How does Jesus grow if he is entirely containing all of God's power? I mean, in wisdom. I mean, you could say stature. Well, he's a boy. He's a, he's a young man. He's grown into man. Like, of course, he had to grow. Like, but it said wisdom. In favor with God, he grew in favor with God and man. Like, again, you look at Scripture, get out from under, like, what our preconceived ideas are here, and you find Jesus stepped out of his existence of the, as the Word in its entirety. He stayed connected to the Father. Why? Because he was the seed of God in, in Mary. Okay, if you just understand just the natural reproductive process, women don't carry seed, all right? God deposited, the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, deposited that, that baby. Now, if, if it was somehow God fertilized an egg in her, I don't know that. Again, there's a lot of people that argue all that and how it happened. Wasn't there. Don't know. All right? So the idea of the fact that the Holy Spirit overshadows and she is with child, we can read that. So we know Jesus was not tainted by a natural father's bloodline. So he didn't possess sin. He is, he is becoming the second Adam. He is, he is sinless. But you never find him in anything recorded about him that he performed any miracles until he was 30 and he was anointed by the Spirit of God. Okay, again, context clues. A plus B equals C. So you started looking at this. Jesus, to fulfill the age of the priesthood, the priesthood you didn't go into to your age 30, he gets baptized in the natural by his cousin, John the Baptist. He's baptized, and, and, and we're going to dive into some down the road. I was unpacking with this. Like, it's beautiful that John the, the Baptist was the one that recognized him because John was a pure blood. Pure blood, his dad and mom were both of the house of Aaron. And so you have a designated pure blood priest in the lineage of Aaron saying this lamb is worth worthy, this lamb is holy. Cool picture in the scripture that we just read right over. But God had someone in the lineage of the priest to reveal this lamb is worthy. That'll preach, I'm telling you. So anyway, we keep going. You look at this, so put all these context clues together he, Jesus, has to be filled with the Holy Spirit and power. He's got to be anointed. So if Jesus, the Son of God, the incarnate Son of God, has to be anointed by the Holy Spirit, sign me up. And it's not till after the 40 days, I mentioned this morning about the Lent season, the 40 days in the wilderness. When he comes back, y'all remember the first miracle, his mom's like, come on, Jesus, it's time Turn that water into wine. Like, no miracles are ever accounted for until after he is what you read right here, Peter said, was anointed by his father. So think about this. He was anointed to do what the father was doing and anointed to say what the father was saying. And so we watch the actions, what he's performing. He is actually modeling it all after the father, doing good, healing all who are oppressed by the devil. So Peter believed and taught publicly that sickness, catch that, is equated with demonic oppression. What did Jesus do when he was anointed the Holy Spirit power? He went destroying the works of the devil. He went freeing people, people who were oppressed by the devil. He healed them all. So Peter is connecting the origination of sin, sickness, all that to demonic oppression. So let's land this plane. Let's think about this. And again, this is just preparing our thoughts, the posture of our heart, Laying the foundation, so let's start just asking these questions. And this isn't like discussion, but this is kind of, let's start making sure we're checking together. Who did Jesus model his actions after? The Father. Okay, we get that. What did the Father anoint him with? Holy Spirit of power. Jesus needs that. 
We need that. Why? We're his body in the earth. What are we anointed with? Just said it. Tell me again. Holy Spirit, power. It's the same spirit. That's when Jesus says the same spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in us and quickens us. It's the same spirit. What did Jesus do with this power? Yep. He did good and he healed all who were sick. Where did Peter believe sickness came from? Demonic oppression. One word answer, who did Jesus heal? Was it Jesus' will to heal? I mean, we can deduct then that it's the Father's will to heal, right? If Jesus' will was to heal, the Father's will was to heal. Why? Why do we know that it's the Father's will to heal? I mean, you see how it's, I mean, you know, you're like, well, Steve, I'm like, little kids can answer this. And adults struggle with it every day. Jesus did what he saw the Father doing. How many accounts are in the Gospels of anybody questioning if it's God's will to heal? One. So if you believe that's God's will to heal all, how would that change How should that change your prayer life? I want you to think about that. We're going to discuss just a couple minutes here. But if you guys are watching this, thanks for joining us. We'll be back in a couple weeks. We're believing God's going to teach us of how to go to the next level in this area and this topic of healing. We love you. Have a great week.